um wow for me it had always kind of been a bit of a of an escape you know and i felt i kind of feel like a lot of ways that i've been you know using it as as a as a crutch and uh you know so a lot of you guys know right i've been clean for a long time i haven't done drugs of any kind that includes alcohol marijuana fucking anything it would be nine nine years in January, right? So I have not done any like drug for 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 fucking nine years, man. It's a long time. It's a long time to not have any fucking alcohol and not smoke a joint. Uh, and this is this is someone who, since the age of twelve, smoked pot and drank either either one of those two every day. You know, twelve years old was smoking pot, drinking like every day. 13, 14, 15. Uh, when I was 13, I uh, broke my leg, you know, was put on Percocets. And by that age, by, by about the age of four, by the age of 15, I'd say I was like fully addicted um, to opiates. So you got to think of that. So from when I was about 12 to let's say, what, nine years, I'm about, I want to be 34. So from the age of 12 to 25, I was getting high in some way, shape, or form almost every day, right? That's a long time. And, um, and, you know, I started playing WoW, obviously, before I got clean. As I started playing WoW when I was, like, um, 12, what, well, no, not 12, hold on. I, was, I started playing WoW when I was 17? Yeah, I was, uh, or 18. It's like, my, my senior year of high school. And, um, fuck, man, I loved it, right? You know, MMORPGs are so cool in a way because, like, I was immediately drawn to it. You know, just having the ability to to play with other people. You know, especially someone like me, who you wouldn't have guessed this, but when I was younger, man, I was a very shy person. Um, because of my Tourette's and my tics and my mental health shit, you know, I had, I'd always kind of been... Um, an, an isolated person, you know, until I met a, a certain group of friends when I... Uh, when I turned about 13, 12, 13. Um, so wow, it was great for me, right? Cause like you could, you could associate people with people if you wanted to at, at your own kind of risk, right? So like if you wanted to talk to somebody, you didn't have to engage with them, but you can engage if you wanted to. And if you didn't want to, it's fine. You know what I mean? So like, I, I really liked that about wow. I love that I could fucking, you know, talk with people who I got along with and with other people I didn't have to really deal with. So, I had started playing WoW, you know, it was like late vanilla, and um, I ended up going to rehab for the first time when I was 18. So, just a quick story about that. So, when I was in high school, my addiction had gotten really bad. You know, I was, I was like, I remember I was like snorting pills in class. Um, and this is when, you know, if you got any of you guys are familiar with, uh, some of the drugs around that time. So this is like 2005, 2006, yeah, 2006, 2005, 2006, Oxycontin was fucking everywhere, man. Especially in Philly where I'm from. Uh, and it was Oxycontin 80 milligram pills, right? So I had started off, you know, with Percocets and all that other shit. Yeah, you know, I mean, I graduate. It's like you graduate, right? You, you go from one thing to another. So I started off with like doing fucking, you know, perk fives, perk tens, and then you know, obviously I was doing other shit at the time, smoking a lot of pot, drinking, taking Xanax, you know, taking mushrooms, LSD, whatever I can get my hands on, right? But like opiates in the form of like Percocets and and oxycodone, all that kind of shit was like my, you know, Vicodin, whatever, was my thing. If I could get my hands on them. It was game, you know? And so from a really early age, I, I realized like, shit, okay, you know, shit's expensive, man. <laughs> it is not cheap. Anyone who, who, who's been an addict, he knows, especially with like pills, man, that shit is really expensive, dude. So growing up in Philly, you know, I, I knew a lot of people who were kind of unsavory characters, right? So it was easy for me, man. It was easy for me to get shit or people would steal shit from the parents, would bring it into school and everyone knew who I was. Everyone knew Matt, you know, um, they called me by another nickname, Juice, back then. <laughs> it's a long story. 
Yeah, my nickname was Juice. J U I like whatever. Yeah, Juice. Um, so I had a couple other nicknames too. But anyway, so they knew like I was the guy, man. You know, and people wanted shit. I could get it. Uh, especially my junior year, my June, no, yeah, my junior year of high school. So freshman, sophomore year, I went to all boys Catholic school and it fucking sucked, man. And my teachers hated me. I hated my teachers. There was some really crazy shit going on there. Like a bunch of the priests at that school actually got caught fucking molesting kids. Yeah. It was father judge. Uh, high school in Northeast Philly. And, you know, after one of the teachers admitted to my mom that he was purposely trying to fail me and all that shit happened with the, with the pedophilia and all that shit, my mom's like, you're getting the fuck out of this school. Right. So she took, and, and at this time, like I said, I'm already, you know, I'm already addicted to fucking perks at this point. My mom didn't know but I was getting them on the DL from my friends, from people that I knew. I, I, I would, you know, I had a supplier, like, and, you know, I, I did whatever I had to do. You know what I mean? Like, I, I wasn't stealing yet at this age. Luckily for me, I had worked every summer from the time I was 12 years old. And I used to get paid $10 an hour under the table as a fucking 12 year old, well, 13. Um, I used to make $10 an hour under the table as a 13 year old man and you know i saved up all that money during the summer and i had access to it whenever i wanted so you know i had a lot of money saved up at a young age so you know i had thousands of dollars in a bank account and i would take money out you know use it whatever i had a little bit of an allowance and shit like that because i you know did chores and whatever because this is this is after my mom and i moved to the northeast we weren't like because we were really poor before that we grew up in south philly in a, in a row home. but you know anyway so my mom's like you're getting the fuck out of the school there's it's full pedophiles and people uh that have cheated you and all this cool bullshit right so i go to another school and this school was a charter school in uh if anyone knows philly area it's in the frankfurt arsenal so this school was like a fucking prison man so it's in an old let me sh i'll show you guys a picture of the frankfurt arsenal um, it, it, it's in an old arsenal that was used during, um, World War II. And so you go in there and it, and it feels, it feels like a prison because it's all gated and walled up. So just real quick, here's a picture of it, um, right here. So I don't know if you can see from here, but like, this is a gate. This is actually not what it looked like when I went there. It was actually a lot jankier looking than this. It kind of looked like this, basically. Huge fucking like wall in the front. And you went in there and you know, there was like guards in the front. And then as soon as you got there, you were searched, right? Um, so you were searched and you know, we did, we did a lot of crazy shit to get drugs into the school, right? First of all, there was a security guard that we were cool with who wouldn't search us. But what, what, so what I mean by that, they would search us, but they would only search our backpack. So basically anything we had on us, we could get into school. So, you know, we would put shit in our shoes. They never checked our shoes, right? We knew how to get shit in, okay? So I go to the arsenal, uh, the school in the Frankfurt Arsenal, and the drugs that were available in this high school, and I don't know how it is now, man, but like growing up, Dude, high school, man, like, especially growing up in Philly, I guess, like, drugs were everywhere, dude. I mean, you could get anything from pot to heroin in the school I went to. And everything in between. Right? And I, to be 100% honest with you guys, I was one of the known, like, people who dealt with a lot of this shit, right? So my junior year of high school, man, I, I grew my hair out long. Right, I, I looked the part. I looked like a fucking hippie, um, and you know, I was starting to get really bad with with um, with oxys and other pills and shit like that. Uh, we diving into it. Then? Yeah, we're diving into it right now, man. I <laughs> just went, I just went balls deep, bro. But um, you know, so my but but it wasn't until my senior year. So so my junior year, summer of junior year. 
I decided, you know, I'm sick of being like the stoner dude. Like who I was popular, but I wasn't like as like I wasn't like, you know, in the in in crowd, right? I knew everyone. That was the thing about being like the stoner guy, whatever, right? I knew everyone. I was cool with everyone, but I wasn't like in in. I wouldn't like hang out with them on the weekends and shit. I had my own group of friends. But that all changed when I came back senior year, fucking Jack. I was like 230 pounds, all fucking muscle. I cut my hair, you know, um, and I was even so like I had pretty much at this point stopped taking all other drugs and I was just taking, um, you know, like oxys and, 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 and perks because at this point I felt like the other drugs were just interfering with my high. Right. And I was the kind of addict who, like, I went to the gym every day, right? I I, I worked out. I fucking I was like a, a like a working addict. You know what I mean? And I, I'm 18 years old at this point, right? So I go, I show back up senior year of high school. I'm fucking jacked, 2:30, right? But I'm no longer like the stoner kid. You know, I'm fucking part of like the it crowd now, right? I, I'm in, man, and. Any of those dudes who needed anything, I was their go-to guy, right? Oh, man, we need pot. We need, you know, zannies. We need perks. I was the guy. I was the middleman. I would hook it up for them. And, um, you know, I, I, I became really popular. Not just with the dudes, but with the ladies, too, right? And this was so out of character for me, right? Two years ago, I was the loner fucking stoner kid in an all-boys Catholic high school. Who, you know, I would talk to people and shit like that, and I would I would have fun here and there, and I would joke around, but I was like, you know, kind of like off to myself, and now I am like fucking, you know, in the center of attention. I'm fucking laughing, I'm joking. I felt like I was on top of the world, dude. I had become everything I wanted to be. I was good looking, popular with the girls, popular with all the guys too, like we would all hang out every weekend. You know, I'd go drinking, hanging out, go on dates with girls, um, you know, go to go to fucking bars with like, you know, fake IDs and all this shit. And I was living the life, man, that I always wanted, right? I'm fucking popular. I'm getting girls. I'm having fun. I mean, like, when I look back on my life, even though I was doing a lot of crazy shit at that time and I was, you know, addicted, fully addicted, um... This is like, I mean, you know, a lot of memorable moments, right? A lot of fun. And this is why it got really dangerous, man, because all I started to see, all I was seeing was the positive, right? I hadn't gotten really any negative from, from this yet. You know what I mean? I had money, right? So I wasn't robbing anyone. I wasn't stealing. Um, I never got arrested. I never got caught. You know, I had fucking, I was doing, I was crushing pills up and storing them in class, never got caught, yada, 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 everything was good, right, my senior year of high school, guys, and I mean this, I really mean this, I did no work, I had a weightlifting class, an art class, um, and all my other classes were just like bullshit, I never did my homework, I never did any of the schoolwork, I would cheat on my tests, and I passed every grade, everything, because the teachers were just like, whatever, just fucking pass them, they're seniors, you're good, boom. So at this point, I've had z literally zero fucking consequences, zero consequences. I would, I would show up, me and my buddy, we would snort oxys in the fucking, um, in the bathroom or in the uh, locker room for a gym, I would buy whatever I needed from them, you know, I would go home. And this is, okay, so Oxycontin 80 milligrams, I was getting them for $30 a pill. That's $30 for one pill. They were usually selling for $50 a pill. Think about that, man. $50 for one pill. But these are really fucking strong pills, okay? Like, when I mean strong, I mean strong. Um, but I got to the point eventually where I was taking three or four Oxy-80s a day, okay? That's, you know, $100, $120 a day a lot of money man money's starting to run out um 
Let me just read a couple of uh, weights are addicted to. Yes, they are, man. And I got addicted to that too. I got addicted to feeling good, right? I got addicted to looking good. I got addicted to the whole thing, man. The popularity, the girls, the way I felt. I got addicted to all of it. Um, nice to catch you too, man. Yeah, OC got me in the W. That same here, man. That's uh, yeah. T uh, I f so, you know, like I said, I, I started um, at 12 with smoking pot and drinking broke my leg at 13 got the perks right and from the ages of 13 to 17 i did every fucking drug under the sun that was available to me but you know I, you know i'm talking about you know hallucin hallucinogens i'm talking about xanax everything but when i got 17 years old i said fuck everything else all i want is the fucking oxys that's it everything else is just fucking with my high right so senior year ends, right? Um, some drama happens with senior year. Uh, you know, little, little, just the kind of shit that happens in high school, right? Certain friends do this, certain friends do that. And now one thing I didn't realize is, and this, this is something that I look back on and, I, and I'm kind of hold a lot of guilt with, is I introduced, man, I introduced a lot of people to Oxys. I was their first taste of it right i could get it people were interested you know back then we were just we would we would take some perks we would take some zannies we would smoke some pot you know do some shrooms do some acids stuff like that and like i had a huge and we were like a gang basically but like we, we weren't a gang but we, I mean, we were like 40 50 guys and girls who would hang out so i had my neighborhood friends i had my school friends they intertwined a little bit sometimes but I, uh, I introduced them, a lot of people, and I saw how quickly they were getting hooked, man. I remember my one buddy, Steve, man, I gave him a little piece, a little tiny piece of an Oxy one day. And within a week, within a week, he was buying one every fucking day, man. And by the way, these are the same pills that were being pushed to doctors as non-addictive non-addictive fucking medicine man that these doctors were getting fucking cuts from that's a whole nother story right so senior year ends okay we're in the summer senior year now i graduate i'm 19 actually 19 you know i'm i'm, I'm messing around with wow at this point like i played wow a little bit you know it's still vanilla still out i don't think tbc had come out yet um i i play video games every once in a while but my main life is getting high going out Meeting girls, partying, having fun, doing that whole thing, right? Man, it's fucking senior year, you know? Then time comes where I'm running out of money, okay? All that money that I made working those summers is gone now. I am fucking out of money, and I have a habit that is $100 to $120 at least a day, okay? Three, four Oxy 80s a day, and I was getting them for $30, $30 each, which is a fucking deal because, like I said, they were $40 each for anyone else, Okay? Yeah, dope sick on a Hulu, man. I know I gotta I gotta check that out. My mom's been telling me about it. So I saw running out of money. So my brother at this time works at a casino. He's like, hey, I'm like, hey, dude, I need a job. He's like, okay, I can get you a job at this casino that I work at. Uh, I know the boss. You just gotta apply and we'll get you in. I'm like, all right, bet, cool. So I go in there and I go to my interview, and I'm high as fuck in my interview, man. I am I am like, like, okay, so it's weird about how oxys made me feel. So a lot of people, you see people nowadays who do heroin, like they're nodding out, right? They're fucking, you know, look like they're out of it. But when I was on oxys, man, I was like hyper, not hyper, but I, I was like, it, it wasn't, yeah, it was like more like speeding than it was like nodding, right? But you also had that euphoria feeling. So you're like itching your face a lot, right? You're scratching your face a lot. Your eyes are like pins, man. And it's a totally different feeling than like what heroin is, right? And, um, but I'm still, you can tell I'm fucked up, right? Because I, at this point, like I said, I'm taking like four oxys a day. And my boss, the, his interview to me was to play tic-tac-toe, okay? You know, tic-tac-toe with the fucking O's and X's. The dude tried to, purposely let me win and i ended up tying him because i was that fucked up right and he looks at me and says are you high right now and i'm like no no man no not at all 
Uh, so I get the job, right? I get the job, and I did a urine test. I did all that shit, but guess what? I didn't hear nothing back from him. So I'm like, okay, I got the job, right? I'm working there. I'm working there, you know? Now, this is when my addiction starts getting really fucking bad, man. Okay, so I'm at the point, dude, where I'm fucking taking five now oxys a day, sometimes six, right? I don't have enough money, man, okay? And I start stealing from anybody, from anybody, okay? I start stealing, money starts disappearing from places. Shit starts disappearing from home. I'm still living with my mom at this point. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was about to move out, but I didn't because I had no money. All my money was going to drugs, right? So shit starts happening, and I fucking overdosed, okay, in front of my brother, right? Fucking passed out in front of him and start fucking, it, it was horrible, right? So my shit's out there now. Everyone knows I'm fucking, I'm fucking, like, using, okay? Uh, a lot of, like, really horrible shit starts happening at this time, okay? Like, really bad shit. Like I said, I'm, I'm robbing people. I'm fucking, I'm a totally different person than I was, right? No longer going out, hanging out on the weekends with friends. I'm fucking going down to Kensington and trying to get heroin now because guess what? The oxys are too fucking expensive. So I go to my buddy, I said, dude, I can't keep paying for this shit. So he says, all right, well, I know what I could do. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I felt so bad, man. When I, when I fucking OD'd with my, with Maldoran, like that was, yeah, that was bad. Um, but so this is the point where I can't afford docs anymore, right? So I I start at this point I was only snorting heroin, but still, right? And this made me completely different, right? I was not that you know hyper whatever feeling anymore. This was like me nodding out, passing out all the time, and you know I'd still do the oxys when I can, but I was doing heroin too. And this is when I first started to feel the consequences of, you know, being an addict, right? I mean, before it was all fun and games and I was having fun and I was getting girls and I was living the life, man. And now my whole life turned upside down, right? I'm fucking hurting the people I love. I'm fucking robbing them. I'm stealing from them. I'm lying to them. Um, I'm, you know, miserable every day. I'm going to work and I'm sick. I'm calling out every other day because I'm sick. And I'm, you know, if, ever, if anyone's ever been dope sick, it, it literally feels like you're dying right so one day i come home and i walk in and everyone is in my living room my whole family right i'm like fuck dude what the fuck is this it was the intervention right so man i still remember this shit right Th this this was i mean like to see all the hurt and pain on all my family's faces man like Unless you've been through something like that, man, it, it is such a, you just feel like an absolute piece of shit, bro, right? Like, it is the worst feeling, man. You know, your mom's crying, uh, you know, you're, everyone's just fucking like, you know, telling you all the shit about you. And, and, and I'm just like, all right, dude, whatever you want me to do, I'll fucking do it, right? I'll go to rehab. Whatever I got to do, I'll fucking beat this shit, you know? And, and you know, but meanwhile, in my head, right, I'm just like, I'm just going to do what they're going to, what they say, and then I'll just come home and I'll keep using, right? Because, like, guys, at this point, I've already been using every day in my fucking life for over five years. I don't remember what it's like to be me, not on drugs anymore, Right? I don't know, I don't even know who the fuck I am. I, I turned into like a robot, man. You know, every day was just get high, do this, do that. So I go to rehab and, you know, they wean you off. It took a couple days and then I get off the shit and I am fucking miserable. And I don't just mean like depressed. I mean like I, I have no motivation I, my, my, I don't want to function. I don't want to do anything. It was like I woke up from a fucking dream, but now my new life was a nightmare, right? Because all those insecurities that I had about myself came back like that, you know, like just like that, man. 
my Tourette's, my tics, right? Um, and guess what the first thing that I start doing is, right? I start eating, I start eating, I start eating. So I start gaining weight because it's like the only thing I can cope, I can do to fill this huge fucking uh, uh, hole that I just had that I was filling with drugs for the last five, six years, right? So I start eating like crazy, okay? I think I gained like 30 pounds in rehab, dude. Ridiculous, right? I gained like 30 pounds in rehab. I get out of rehab. I'm 19 years old, right? And I find out that one of my best friends died while I was in rehab, okay? So I come out of rehab. My buddy comes to my house. He's like, yeah, you know, so-and-so is dead. And I'm like, I actually started laughing because I thought he was joking. And I remember this, uh, I remember this so clearly because like my head was so fucked up at that point that I didn't know how to feel. Like I didn't know, like emotions just like didn't work anymore in my head. So I like, I started laughing and I'm like, and then I, I'm like, wait, like what? Right. A and he tells me again and I'm like, no, no way, dude. Like I just saw him before I went into rehab. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Right. So, you know, and now, you know, I I'm, I'm, I'm like so torn, right? Because I want to go back and hang out with my friends and be together with them. But guess what? Every single one of my friends either drinks, smokes pot, is on fucking Xanax, is on fucking heroin, is on fucking... Like, every single one of them. I mean, even my one buddy who was like my, my other closest friend, he would come over and hang out with me. But like at night, he wanted to go out drinking with the dudes. You know what I mean? Like fucking 19, right? And now I'm going to these meetings and they're telling me I can't do another drug for the rest of my life. I'm like, this is, this is my, this is my life. Like my whole life revolved around getting drunk and getting high every fucking day. Like, what are you talking about? I can't do any drugs anymore. What the fuck? Right? So guess what I do? I do the only fucking thing I know I can do. And that's stay home every fucking day and play World of Warcraft. Right? And eat. That's it, man. That was my life for a year. Every fucking day. Okay? Wake up. Play well. Eat a bunch of food. Go to sleep. Go to a meeting. Right? I would go to these fucking meetings. I would listen to all these people. Tell them the problems. Tell them the shit. And I would never say a fucking word. And I turned back, I turned back into the fucking kid me. Who was 10 years old. Who was afraid, you know, of what everyone thought about me uh, because of my tics, because of my weight. I turned into, you know, isolation mat again, right? So this is the me who I was when I lived in South Philly when I was insecure. When I, all my friends, you know, turned on me because my mom got divorced and all this shit. And because of my Tourette's and all this other fucking shit, right? So I turned right back into that version of me overnight man all that shit that i loved about myself about you know being in shape and getting girls all of that fucking disappeared as soon as i stopped taking the drugs all of it it was like it was an illusion it was like it was never there so you know in my head i'm like uh okay yeah doing drugs is really bad because i hurt my family and i you know i lost all this shit i lost all this but on the other side, I feel like I've just been castrated. I feel like I've just been fucking, you know, like, 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 what is the point of living at this point, right? Like, I am so miserable. And here's what I didn't understand, right? When you do an opiate for so long, when you do heroin, your body stops creating dopamine on its own because it's reliant, or, or, or what happens is your body needs so much more dopamine, right? Because your body is releasing so much dopamine when you're doing heroin. So now that you're off heroin, your body's like, uh, what the fuck? We got all these receptors now that are looking for dopamine, but you're not giving it to me. So your brain chemistry literally changes. Okay. And it takes a long fucking time. If I, you know, when I was, I was using, like I said, for, uh, opiates for already like four years at that point, my brain chemistry was so fucked. And it's like in my head, it's just like, you know, get high, get high, get high, get high, get high, get high. And you're chasing, 
And I always remember I'm just chasing that original feeling of that first time I took an Oxy because it was like the best fucking feeling I ever had. And I just like, you got to feel that again. You got to feel that again. You know, meanwhile, all I'm doing every day is playing WoW. You know, um, uh, TBC had just come out. So TBC's out. I'm playing WoW. I actually met some really cool people this time in life. I, I met this guy who was in, uh, you know, deployed in Iraq. And he had come back and was playing WoW. He had a lot of PTSD problems and shit. And, you know, him and I would talk. Like, you know, and this is the first time where, like, like playing WoW actually fucking, like, helped me. You know what I mean? Because I, I met someone who was going through a kind of a similar thing than I, that I had. And that was the only saving grace, man, I had was, was the ability to reach these people through WoW. That was it. That was it, man. Going to the meetings, I wasn't partaking in them, right? So I would go to a meeting like once a week and it didn't do shit, man, because I wasn't listening. I wasn't listening. I wasn't talking and I would come home and I would fucking, you know, I would, I would, I would play well. And, and, I, and then the time came where I just, I couldn't do it anymore, man. Every day of my life, I'm a 20 year old guy, I'm fucking 20 years old. I haven't been with a girl in a year, right? Okay, think about it. You're 20, right? And I and when I was 18, 19, I'm not trying to like, but I was like, you know, I was active, you know, sexually. I was like, you know, out every night. I was doing shit. So now I'm I'm not I'm I'm 20 years old now. I've gained like a hundred pounds, haven't been with a girl, like I said, in a fucking year. Um I get a job. I'm working back at the casino, believe it or not. They fired me when I got when I when I when I went to rehab the first time. Because they said, oh, your drug test came back after three months or four months of working there. And they're like, oh, you, yeah, you failed your drug test. I'm like, yeah, I'm in rehab now. So they actually hired me back. I'm working there. And I'm like 20 years old. And you know what? I'm like, dude, I'm going to lose some weight. And I'm going to try to feel better with myself, right? So I start, you know, working out. And guess what happens? Within like a month of working out... And trying to do shit, I'm like, man, this would be a lot easier if, you know, because like, I, so the one of the main reasons I lost all that weight back on that junior year summer was because when I had done pills a lot and shit like that. So when you take pills, you don't want to eat, right? Because if you eat, it fucks with your high. So you would like, I would like take pills on an empty stomach so that it would fuck with my, it would like make me higher. So I am like, I'm thinking to myself in the head, I'm like, man. You know, I can really get back into shape quickly and do all this. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe if I just um, take a couple pills a day to help me out. And, and at first I was like, you know what? I'm going to uh, try taking methadone pills, right? Because I thought like, oh yeah, methadone pills. But like methadone only works for people who are, first of all, you know, it doesn't, you can't take methadone when you're not on anything, right? Like you take methadone to help get off of heroin, not when you're not on it. So I started off taking that, which would just make me high, right? Because I wasn't coming off of anything. And I'm like, this fucking sucks because this is methadone. It's not what it's, you know, supposed to be used for. So I'm like, let me go get some Percocets, whatever. Now, guess what? Within a week, I'm already fucking using Oxy. Okay. Oh, I forgot how that, how that story. I'm sorry. Let me go back. Let me go back a little bit. So I'm losing weight. And I meet this girl. So I have a one of my best friends at that time in my life. Her name is Angela. Okay. And I'm, I was really good friends with her boyfriend. So I took her sister to prom because the girl that I was seeing at the time couldn't go to prom because she, she yeah, it was all this shit. So I took her sister to prom. Um, so I started to hang out with them again before I relapsed. Right. And I told him, I said, Hey, listen, I can come hang out, whatever, but I can't drink. I can't do all this shit. So one night I go over to their house and I'm talking to Angela and I'm talking, I go up and I talk to her sister and we're talking about shit. And she texts me late on that night. She's like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't even really like her. I, I wasn't like looking for anything, but she texts me back and I'm like, okay, yeah, let's like, you know, get together one night. So I go out one night with her. Right. And I'm like, and, and I was 20 this type point, but like, we knew all the places I could go to drink at 20, right? So I go there and I'm like, fuck, man, I'm the only guy out here and I'm not fucking drinking. You know what I mean? I'm like, dude, 
this is how it started out. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, let me get a rum and coke. I was never really an alcoholic, even though I did used to drink like crazy a lot. Um, I was like, let me just get a rum and coke and, um, you know, I'll, I'll be good. So drink the rum and coke. You know, she, they're all, she's dancing with her sister. We got there, we're dancing and shit. And like I said, at this point, I had lost some weight. I'm feeling better about myself again, right? I'm not back to what I was my senior year when I was like 230 fucking like, you know, all muscle. But I'm, I'm you know, feeling good. And have another drink, have another drink. Well, guess what? So I didn't know this about the girl, but she was a complete, a complete Xanax uh, addict and I didn't know this about her at the time. I knew she fucked around with a lot of shit um, Because when I took her to prom we ended up going down and buying Xanax and drinking a bunch of liquor and and yeah, it was a crazy night, but So she fucking somehow either robbed some dude or found a bottle full of pills like this of just oxy Xanax uh, Percocets everything in this pill bottle and she passes out in my car right so she passes out in my car and i'm sitting there i had two drinks right and i see the fucking bottle and she's like and sh so i try we drive to her house and i'm like live live let's go her name is olivia and i'm like let's go let's go and she just passes out in the car and i see the fucking pill bottle and i'm like what the fuck is that i pick it up and i'm like holy shit this is a fucking pill bottle full of and she, i don't even know if she knew she stole it um, so I'm like, fuck dude. Um, so I, I close it and I put it in my center console and I got it. I got her out of the car, picked her up, took her inside. And I'm like, just leave them in there. See if she remembers them and I'll give them to her tomorrow. Right. I'm like, if she remembers them that she got them or whatever, I'll fucking give them to her tomorrow and I won't take any. But if she doesn't remember, then I guess they're mine, right? You know, so see how this happened? It started with that drink. Then it started with her finding those pills, okay? So guess what? She wakes up, has Xanax makes you forget like crazy, okay? Especially when you take Xanax and alcohol. Yeah, it's called like, good night, dude. You, you have no memory. You're blackout, okay? So she has no fucking clue about these pills, right? So that night or that morning, the next day, I go home. And there's the fucking bottle for full pills and shit. And here's the other thing about it too. I'm not going to, you know, I'm a dude. I'll be honest with you guys. And, you know, something a little, maybe a little bit too, uh, a TMI. But when it came to how I was with women on drugs and on, uh, on not on drugs and alcohol. First of all, I was so much more confident when I was on drugs, right? Because all those insecurities about myself and my Tourette's and all this shit phew, went right out the window. And number two, you know, it actually, what I thought, improved my sexual performance, right? Because, like, for whatever it was, I don't know, I just felt like I could go longer and harder, you know what I mean? Like, it was, that's that's all I felt, which probably wasn't true. Uh, maybe it was, I don't know. But that's how I felt, right? So, number one, you had the confidence booster of both of those things. I'm like, dude, you know, I'm seeing this girl now, right? I, I want to fucking... I want to, you know, portray the best version of myself or what I think is the best version of myself, right? So I start seeing this girl and I'm like, okay, now if I want to be like the old me that I knew uh, from, you know, my senior year of high school when I was dating girls and I was the life of the party and all this shit, it's what I was using, right? So I start off, I'm like, okay, I'm only going to take these pills when I'm at night and like when I'm hanging out with the girls and you know and 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 going clubbing and shit because I used to, we go clubbing all the time and shit so I'm like I'm only gonna take the pills when I go out and that's how it started I only took the pills when I went out I would take them you know what I mean and I would still go to the fucking meetings tell people I was clean like yeah man I got my I remember I got my year token I got my year token and I had relapsed that weekend so I didn't even make a year because I was about to make a year and then that weekend was the fucking year that I was going to hit, you know, my one year. And I, that's when I relapsed. So I go to the meeting and I'm like, oh yeah, I got my one year token. Meanwhile, in my car, I got this bottle full of pills, right? So what happens? What do you think happens? I start taking more and more of the pills, start taking more of them, start taking more of them. Meanwhile, the girl that I was with 
she's remember she's got her own issues she's an addict she you know we're younger and nothing against her now i'm sure she's a great person now right but she loved drama okay so she would talk to other guys and make them come see her when she was going out with me just so that me and that guy would get in a fight okay this is the kind of shit she did so and like and then she would it, it was like a crazy mind game shit right so and all this time this is going on i'm drinking more i'm taking more pills all this shit and i didn't know this at the time man but she was trying to get pregnant and luckily i didn't get her pregnant another guy did after i stopped dating her but then i would still you know i, I was like i said her sister was my best friend so i'd go over there every night and i still remember man this one day because you know i remember i was over her house and at this point dude i'm full-blown addict again and her sister was so proud of me uh angela she was so proud of me that i had gotten clean and like she knew that i was drinking and shit like that but she was like okay as long matt as long as you don't go because she, her sister i went to high school with she saw me every day in school, you know, nodding out. I remember one day I was blurring to the teacher and she's like, shut the fuck up. You're going to get caught. Cause I, I, I was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like trying to talk to the teacher. And, and like, so she was so proud of me that I was doing good. She's like, okay, you're drinking. That's fine. Just don't fucking do this shit again. I never forget this, man. I went to Wawa and I go to her place and she's sitting on her bed doing homework. You know, she's in college at this point and she's sitting there doing her homework and I'm sitting on the ground and I start nodding out. Right. And I look up and I see her in fucking tears. Right. Crying. I'm like, what's the matter? She's like, you're fucked up. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm good. I'm cool. She's like, you're fucked up. And I'm like, and I, you know, I was like, I, this girl, like we were like almost like brother and sister, right? Like her, her fucking dad used to date, uh, you know, her, her whole family's from South Philly. My whole family's from South Philly. Her dad used to date my, uh, you know, this girl in my family or my stepdad's sister, her mom worked with my dad. Like this girl is like, basically like, you know, family. Right. And she's sitting there fucking weeping about how I relapsed. And she's like, get the fuck out, get the fuck out. Like screaming at me, screaming at me, man. And I'm just like, felt like such a fucking piece of shit again, dude. But guess what? guilt man is what keeps addicts using so instead of using that and saying like yeah i'm uh, man i should get clean again i should i i, I turned that and, and it just became more fuel to keep using right that's all it became to me so what happened dude shit just got worse and worse and worse and worse and at this point you know it's like a downward spiral right so i was so obsessed about my weight that I wouldn't eat all day. I would just take pills and I wouldn't eat. I think I have pictures somewhere. Um, I got to the point, guys, where I literally... And so I had two sicknesses going on. I had my addiction to the pills and heroin and everything else. And I had my fucking anorexia. Okay, so I... When I, I would look in the mirror... And I was so sure that I was fat and fucking, you know, didn't look right, didn't look good, and all this shit. And meanwhile, I'm a guy, I'm 6'3", I was 140 pounds, right? I was so fucked up in my head, man. Like, everyone around me is telling me, like, holy shit, Matt, you're, you're, you're fucking... You look like you're dying. Like you look like you are literally dying. Um, let me, hold on. Uh, I'm trying to find some pictures here so I can show you. Um, so anyway, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's like that downward spiral and every single day. It would get worse and get worse. And here's the thing. When I stopped using, I was using like, you know, four to five oxys a day. When, when I came back, 
I start slowly, but within a week, within a week, man, I'm I was right back to where I was, right back, dude. And I think that's got to be one of the scariest things, right? Because you know, a lot of people who relapse try to do what they were doing when they when they when they um when they were you know using, and they overdose because they think that oh i can just use what i was using and i'll be fine but that's not the case man that is not the case so i was okay so here's a picture of me um so this is let's see this is 2010 so this is a year after what i'm talking about so i i i i was relapsing getting worse every day so i kept on using so like i said 2009 was like when I re around when I relapsed and now this picture right here is from 2010. Okay, so that's me. I was on the right. And you know, you might think I look good here or whatever, but like I got I guys, I got skinnier than this. I got skinnier than this. I mean, you can see my face, right? Like you can see my fucking jawbone. You can see like I, I got so fucking thinny, thinny, skinny, right? That I mean, like, and and here's the thing: I would not eat sometimes for a week because guess what? I had the only thing I need to keep me going, and that was the drugs. That was the only thing I cared about, man. And you know, I don't can't remember how many times I would like pass out because like I didn't, I hadn't, like you can even see like kind of in my eyes where like I, I just don't look. I don't look like okay. So, well, some of these pictures, some of these. So, this is even this is like years before that. I guess these are profile pictures. Yeah, I mean, I had some pictures where, uh, like, I guess this one, I was pretty skinny here. Um, but like I said, I can't really find the ones where I got really. Skinny. I mean, I was like scary skinny. Like, look at my arm, guys. Look how thin my arm is. There, it's just pure bone. Pure fucking bone. And like I said, I'm 6'3". You know, 140 pounds is not good. It's not good. So anyway, um, at that point, you know, my family starts seeing me again. Start seeing where I am. Oops, sorry, I fucked up here. Let me uh, go back to the webcam. They start seeing where I am again. And this is where this, this phase of my life was basically like rehab in, in a rehab, out of rehab, in rehab, out of rehab, in rehab, out of rehab, you know, I lose a job, get another job. And, oh, so these are those girls. Like I said, uh, whatever, I'll, I'll show you guys another time. So, um, this was one of the worst times of my life now. Right. So I'm, li I'm literally getting clean, relapsing, getting clean, relapsing my weight, I would go down to like 130 pounds, then I would get clean, and I would gain all the weight back, right? I remember I gained like 100 pounds so quickly because like when you starve yourself and don't eat, and then you eat again, your body just turns it all into fat, right? Because it's like, oh my god, I'm, we're, we were just starving, so I need to put all this weight back on. So, and you know, the shit that this did to like my psyche, man, was just crazy. So at this point, I really think I started going fucking insane. Um, and at this point I had moved out and I'm living with my brother and my brother's best friend. And the three of us are living in this house. Right. And, you know, I would get clean and then I would relapse and I would have all these like crazy fucking people over and, um, do all this crazy shit. But then, okay. I started to get into like i said i'm at uh, this point i'm in the heroin shit but now one of my friends again like i said oh and in this time is something i just said oh but like so during this time i'm losing friends when i say losing friends like friends are dying every month okay you know people that i grew up with people that are my current friends and people that are like you know friends that i used to hang out with are dying every fucking month overdose 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 I think in one year alone, I lost six, six or seven friends, like close friends, you know? And so all this shit's going on, you know, um, 
I would get in relationships, and then the girls would find out like how fucking you know uh, much of a junkie I was, and it, it, it would end. So I would you know go through that shit in my head, and then I my one of my friends who was on parole or on probation, he was getting drug tested, so he was smoking synthetic marijuana. Those of you who know it, it's called like K2 or Spice, right? So at this point in my life, I am addicted to uh, heroin and pretty much any opiate, right? I can get my hands on. I'm addicted to Xanax, fully addicted to Xanax. I was taking sometimes on average 10 to 15 to 20 Xanax a day sometimes. I was addicted to, uh, uh, I was get, being prescribed Adderall. So I was waking up, taking Adderall and either heroin and um, Oxy, right? So like a speedball, basically doing that. Then to, to calm down, I would take Xanax. And then at night, I would I would start smoking that K2 synthetic spice shit, right? And I'm doing, you know, crack, fucking, uh, I would smoke crack, I would, you know, do, I would shoot up fucking uh, heroin and, and, and cocaine, all this shit. So this is when I'm starting to get really, really, really bad. I got, um, I'm out of work because I took a six month leave. I forget how I did it. I forget why I did it. And one night I remember, so this is when I was like at my worst, one of my, one of my worst, it wasn't my worst, but, um, at this point, I'm doing all this shit, and I don't know if I... i got to be careful how I say this, because I, I know things can be... Certain things can't stay on Twitch. Um, I don't remember exactly my state of mind. I don't know if I was trying to hurt myself. I would imagine I probably was. But I ended up taking 60 pills, 60 Xanax pills in one night. And... It was that night when I was also smoking PCP and this other synthetic synthetic marijuana. So, and, and this had all been like coming to a, a head, right? It's been coming to a point. Like I, there's a couple of weeks where things were going really bad. And, um, you know, I don't want to go through the whole story because it involves other people. But let's just say that night I ended up getting arrested. Ambulances were called. I had like stopped breathing, I went to the hospital, I don't remember any of this, and I woke up like three or four days later in a psych ward, right? And I've told you guys this before that I, you know, was basically uh, in a drug-induced psychosis for almost a month. So I had completely lost my mind. Like, it's hard to describe, right? Because so many things happened during this time. So many crazy fucking things happened. And I, to this day, don't know what was real and what wasn't. So I remember waking up in this psych ward. And I'm, you know, confused. Where the fuck am I? And it's weird because as time went on, you would think I'd get better. But I got worse. Because I guess, I don't know, maybe coming off of all the drugs made things worse. But anyway... It starts off with this guy who was in my room with me. And I, I clearly remember waking up in this bed and being like, how the fuck did I get here? The last thing I remember, I was sitting on the porch outside with my brother. And that was three days ago. So Xanax and shit, right? Obviously, I think they had pumped. I don't know if they pumped my stomach. It was like this whole ordeal when I went to the hospital and um, so I'm in the psych ward and this guy is in the room with me in his bed and he gets out of the bed and looks at me and he goes, I have the disc. I have to hide the disc. And I'm like, what are you, are you talking about? He goes on about the shit about having a disc. And he's got to hide it. Well, this guy had this thing where every hour or uh, it was hour or like half hour on the mark he would get up turn all the lights on in the room and start saying i have to find the disc i have to find the disc i have to find the disc right so i'm like okay i'm obviously in a fucking loony bin right and i go out front and i remember to this day dude i, I tried talking to the nurse 
and I'm like, I need to get the fuck out of here. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know how I got here. And she goes, you can leave whenever you want. And I'm like, what? She's like, you can leave whenever you want. You just have to walk out that door. So in my head, I think I see her like wink at me. And, I, and I'm thinking in my head that she's telling me that I can, I can leave. That I'm like, all I have to do is leave and go out the door. But I have to wait till there's no one else around. So I get up. I remember I went around the corner. So, so if you've ever been in like, a, I don't know if you've ever been in a psych ward, but if you've ever been in like a hospital, right? They have the whole, it's like a long hallway. And on either end, there were doors. There were two doors, but they were double, like double doors. So one would be, um, you know, like a, a locked door that you go through and then another set of doors. So I would see people go in and out of these doors all the time, like the staff, right? And they had to be buzzed through. So they had to buzz the people through. So I'm thinking, this lady is going to tell me, you know, when I'm going to make sure no one else is around. I'm going to go around to the end of that corner. I'm going to look at her, give her the look. And this is all, all in my head. This all makes sense, right? I'm going to give her the look. And then when I go and I go through the door, she'll buzz it open. So first time I give her the look, I see her, she sees me and I try to go through the door. Boom. Door doesn't open. I look at her again. She looks, she, now she's looking at me. She's like giving me like, like not and saying like, yeah, go, go. Like, I'm like, okay. She's telling me to go. Boom. Try to go again. Now in my head, I'm like, okay, I must not be trying hard enough. I need to fucking go through this door really hard. Right? So now I start like almost like taking a couple steps and going into the door with my shoulder. I go back and I look, she's still there, still there standing at the, at the buzzer. And I'm like, there's something wrong here. Like, I must not be doing it at the right time. So now I'm just pushing on the thing, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And now I'm getting fucking mad. So I back up. You gotta remember, this, at this point now, I'm like a big guy. I'm like 250, you know. I have a fucking afro. Like, I, I, my hair in that point, like, I just look so disheveled. I look so crazy. Uh, and um, she keeps on, like, giving me the look. Now, that, to this day, I don't know if she was really there or not. I don't even know if she was a real person, but in my head to this day, like I can still remember what she looks like, everything she did. So now I'm fucking running full force out of this door and bashing into it, running full force, bashing it. Now everyone's awake. Okay. Everyone was asleep. This is the first night I'm there. First fucking night. I've been there for about an hour. Okay. Everyone's out. I keep doing it. Now I turn behind me and there's four security guards. Like, stop running into the door. But in my head, when they say that, I'm thinking that they're giving me the cue to go. So in my head, I'm like, okay, they're telling me not to go, but that must mean that they're actually telling me that I, it's time for me to leave. This is how fucked up I was. I keep going, I keep going, I keep going. Now they're like, okay, the next time you do that, we're going to take you down. So I'm like, now they're, now they're fucking with me. Now, now they're just, now they're like, you know, they're telling me, okay, now I'm like, now is really time to go. Do it again. Next thing I know, the four of them are on top of me. Like, and I, I don't know what the fuck I was on, man. But they they weren't able to take me to the ground for like I was like throwing them off me. I mean, and at this point, something in me was like, fight for your life, right? Because like I thought they were going to kill me. So I'm throwing these guys. I'm punching them. I'm doing, I, I'm really hurting these. Like the one guy had a bloody nose and they ended up getting like four more people and they're just fucking pumping me full of Thorazine, right? If you ever, you know what the Thorazine is, it's a, um, the tranquilizer, right? So they're just pumping me full of Thorazine and I'm still fucking going. I, they get me down on the ground right? And I'm like, I, I managed to get myself in a, in like a corner and my legs were against the wall and my arm and they could not get me out. Eventually, I guess the Thorazine gave in, right? So they get me in and these fuckers are pissed, dude. They are pissed. Now when they capture me, I have it in my mind that, I mean, and I can't tell you guys, like I say this, right? But 
when I say it, it doesn't, it might not give the impact of like how it felt. I 100% believed that they were now about to kill me. Okay. So I am in the most fear I've ever been in my life. I'm thinking they're going to take me into this room and they're going to just fill me full of fucking drugs and kill me. Okay. So, but here's the thing. When you're pumped full of Thorazine, it's the worst thing in the world because you're one, I was 100% aware of everything that was going on, but my body was completely paralyzed. I could not move my arms. I could not even, barely even move my head. So I'm 100% I'm cognizant of everything that's happening, but I'm completely immobile. So to this day, I remember everything that, that happened. They fucking, and this is in my head what I think they're saying. I think they're talking about how they're going to chop my legs off, okay? That we're going to torture. So they were going to chop my legs off one at a time and then perform surgery on me and take out my organs one by one and then I would just bleed out and die. So I honestly believed, like I said, that all of this shit was about to happen. They were going to do this. But... They proceeded to take me into this room. So there was a room right next to like where the station was behind the bars and all behind the glass. And the room looked like a little bit like metal bed with a small mattress on there with two arms that would extend out. And they strapped me down to the bed, right? So you're strapped from your waist, your arms, your legs, everything's strapped, right? And I'm strapped down in this bed. And the hallucinations that proceed from this moment are some of the most horrific, like bizarre. I remember that this one woman came in and she injected me with something and I saw smoke starting to fill the room. And then the room started to change colors. And I thought that the room was catching fire, right? So I, I, I and like, I could remember like feeling the fucking heat. I remember feeling, um, you know, I remember the woman laughing at me. I remember her telling me that I was going to die. Meanwhile, I'm strapped down into a bed and I cannot fucking move. Okay. I was strapped down to that bed for three fucking days, three days, because every fucking time they tried to get me out of there, I immediately went into a room and tried to take a chair and break the window. Okay. And get through there. Because about every hour or so, the hallucinations were changing to something else. So after that first hallucination that I was being burned alive, then my brother was coming into the room to try and save me with my family. And as he ran in there, I can hear his voice saying, Matt, hold on, Matt, hold on, I'm coming. Meanwhile, I hear the cops who come and I hear my brother get shot and die. So I'm fully aware of this and in my head like like i'm cognizant right now it would be like right now i just heard that my brother was shot and killed like i like i didn't see it happen it was all happening behind me but i was aware of it all happening so you know that happened and then meanwhile my mind is just going through all these different things right all these things that are happening then um my aunt came and tried to plead uh, uh with them because she was like a uh, uh, uh you know, she, she, she was my stepdad's sister who was a cop and she was trying to get me out of there. And then I thought that I was actually in a coma. So all these people that I saw in there, somehow they looked like people that I knew from my real life. So there was one guy who was in his forties, but somehow he was my best friend, Eddie. Okay. And he looked like how I imagined he would look like 40 years in the future. Or, I'm sorry, when he was 40 years old. So I now believed that I was like in my 40s. And all these people were coming to tell me through, through some kind of machine that they were hooked up to into my coma. Where I've been in a coma in the last 20 years. And trying to get me to wake up out of the coma. And they kept on telling me that the only way I could get out of the coma was if I died in the coma. So I can, from that moment, was trying to kill myself. I was literally trying to do, I was trying to jump out of windows. 
I was trying to, um, uh, uh, like, like uh, anything I could do, anything I can do. Then, okay, so now they had to strap me down again because they had let me go for a little bit, strap me down again after that because I literally trapped myself in a room. And to give you guys an idea, these win these windows were about this thick and full of mesh metal. I managed to get one of these chairs, it must have been 100, 200 pounds, and smash it almost through the window. The, the glass had begun to break. This is how desperate I was to what I thought, you know, leave this world that was my coma to die so that I could wake up in the real world. Eventually, they got me back in and I'm laying down in my same position, strapped down, uh, strapped to this bed for 24 hours a day, right? And I can't even really begin to explain like how that affects the the mind when you're strapped to a bed like an animal for days at a time. Like my mind was my only escape but I couldn't trust my mind. So my mind would go to these places that were so bizarre and so unsettling that there was just no real escape because in this mind where I was, I was in hell. Like I really believed that I was in hell and that all these people that were there were demons and they were, you know, the devil, like, like, like toying with me. This person had told me that I had killed someone during one of my uh, blackouts and that I was being punished in hell, and this was my punishment, you know, I was going to be in this psych ward for the rest of my life, strapped to this chair, and I remember seeing this kid's face, who I had apparently killed, which obviously had never happened, right, but I remember seeing his face, and, and like, crying and pleading with him to forgive me, because I had killed him, and like, all these scenarios would just play out one after another, one after another, and like I said, then I started to see my family members in the staff and other people that were there. So I went up to this guy and I said to him, I know who you are. And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, I, I know you're my father. I know you're my father. And, you know, just crazy things like that. Another thing was the, the wall, the, the, the doors were wooden, but they were like this weird shade of like, um, almost like skin color. So when I thought I was in hell, I thought that all the doors were actually covered with the skin of my family members. And again, I have to stress this enough. This is things that I believe that was actually real. Another thing was I believe that I had a twin sister who was in there who happened to be black. So I don't know how that worked. Um, again, this is how crazy it was. Oh, she was, she was half black. And somehow she was my twin sister, even though she was only my half sister. I don't know how that works. Um, but... Um, so a guy was hitting on her and I remember going up to him and throwing him out of his chair and throwing the table onto him. And then of course, here comes the guards. Boom. They get me in again. So this went on for, I mean, there's so many stories I could tell. Like I remember hearing music through the walls, um, the, the actual, the actual place itself, the hospital itself was speaking to me almost like a, like a kind of like a shining thing. Um, and eventually I started to believe that I had complete control over everything that was going to happen in my head. Right. So I started to believe that, you know, I, all I had to do was to somehow fake that I was getting better and that eventually they would let me go. So that's what I did. And every day that came on a little bit more a little bit more, you know, maybe sense came back and a little bit more, but I was there for about three or four weeks. And throughout that whole time, I can honestly say that I was 100% completely psychotic, completely psychotic. Um, I remember there was a kid who came in and I felt like it was a test. They were testing me and how I reacted to how this kid was. And I was helping him with stuff. And I didn't even get into the other people that were there. You know, the other, some of the people were really crazy. There was this one girl who were there who thought I was 
the reincarnation of Buddha, of the Buddha, and was like trying to worship me and all this other shit. And of course, you can imagine how that affected me. But when this one kid came in, it was, I felt bad. It was this young um, Filipino kid. And for some reason, I had just felt like I need to do whatever I can to help this kid. Because by helping this kid, it will help me get out of here, right? And it worked. Like, I showed this kid around. I I knew in my head that it was a test, right? Which it wasn't. But if I, you know, the, thankfully the new um, psychotic episode that came, my new, my new uh, you know, hallucination actually helped me to get out of there because it was making me behave normally, behaving rationally. So I was like, it's a test that this, this kid is here and he's testing me and I have to help him or the, the staff is testing me um, to get out of there. And, you know, to this day, I just, it, it, it amazes me in just how powerful the human mind is, right? Like the human mind is capable of such things that I, all of these things were just so real to me. And I remember the day I got out because it was a little bit after Easter. Um, oh, and by the way, at this time, my parents and my brother and all had no idea if I was ever going to come out of this. The doctors didn't know either. They thought I, it was possible that I was going to be like this for the rest of my life. Um, so, so they let me out. Even though I wasn't fully, I wasn't even nowhere near fully okay. Um, but the stipulation was I was going to a rehab on my way out, right? So I remember being picked up in this car. And as I'm being picked up, I'm like, okay, so I'm making it out of here. But I'm not in, like, the world. I'm in this, like, it, it felt like it, like a, it was some kind of post-apocalyptic version of the world that I was once a part of, you know, like the normal world. And I went to this rehab, you know, I had seen my mother and father, but like, it, it wasn't like, I remember I saw them a couple days before I went to the rehab, but I didn't like register that it was actually them. It's like, I, I was going through some other kind of hallucination at the time that I wasn't even fully like aware of their presence. It was so fucking weird, whatever. So that, like I said, I can, I can go on about the whole fucking hospital episode for 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 hours and hours and hours because there's so much shit that happened in that hospital that i still to this day do not know what is real and what isn't i mean it was all real to me right um and maybe one day i'll write it all in a book somewhere and maybe one day i'll fucking tell the whole story but it gets a lot darker than that like that was pretty dark right but it gets a lot more intense and a lot darker than that and there are some moments there where it's really fucking bad. And I still, I mean, I admit, I still have, you know, dreams about it. I still have dreams about being chased and fucking hunted down by these people and shit like that. Um, but I've definitely done a lot of work, you know, on that because it's like, it was a fucking, you know, crazy time in my life. Anyway, I get out of rehab and, and eventually somehow, you know, I start to get a little bit more sane every day. I remember the day I got out of there, I stayed in my room for uh for the first day in the fucking shower. I was in the shower just like on the floor just like bawling my eyes out. Um yeah, hit rock bottom like at that point. Um because like the whole fucking, you know, the whole picture of what was going on just finally started to hit me. Um and you know, I started to realize like what I had done to get in there. And all this shit. And the craziest thing is, I I was in the hospital for a month, and somehow during all that time, and I was denying any drugs. So you have the right to, you know, say no to the whatever drugs I want to get, even though they were pumping me full of shit when I was going through my craziness. The drugs that they were trying to give me, like they were trying to give me all these antipsychotics and shit, I was saying no, no, I don't want them, I don't want them, because I thought they were trying to poison me. So I ended up, you know, somehow getting horribly fucking dope sick in the rehab because the thing is I had, it had been so long since I had actually used, you know, illicit substances. I mean, the shit they gave me in the hospital, whatever I was that they couldn't detox you. 
because there was nothing to detox me off of, right? Because I had been in the hospital for a fucking month. But somehow, when I get to the hospital, now my withdrawal starts. It's like that whole month. But it, I don't think I had enough drugs in my system that lasted a fucking month. So I remember getting to the rehab, and I was withdrawing so bad. So I, at this point, I'm withdrawing off of Xanax. So I'm having seizures. So I'm having these like mini seizures all the time. I was withdrawing off of Xanax, heroin, all the different kinds of opiates. Um, I, I withdrew, withdrawing off of, um, um, fuck, uh, amphetamine, all this shit. I remember I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs. It hurt so bad just to walk up the stairs. And that wasn't that wasn't even the worst withdrawal I've been through. I've been through a withdrawal after that that was that made that look like nothing. But that withdrawal lasted almost almost over a month because here's why too. Because I remember I was taking um, Suboxone, which is a a drug that's meant to be um, taken, you know, to get off of heroin. Right? It's like a medicated assisted treatment. The problem is with Suboxone. You know, you're meant to come off it incrementally, right? So I was taking a whole shitload of it towards the end of my, you know, my, my, when I was using that Suboxone has this, you know, if you go cold turkey off of it at a really high milligram, it is the worst withdrawal you'll ever go through. Well, one of the worst, like I said, I've been through another one that was, and I was sick for like a month. And I remember trying to get up these steps and every fucking step that I took was like the worst pain. Morphe, thank you so much for the gift itself. Um, and then, you know, eventually I started getting better. You know, I started getting more sane. I started getting, um, you know, a little bit more, you know, I was going through, you know, like I said, a lot of just crazy shit, but I was getting a little bit more um, sane. And, you know, this was, I think, one of the, like the fourth times I had been to rehab. And I get out of the rehab and I am like, I am like fucking, I mean, it, it's imagine what I feel like it's like coming, it must be coming back from like war or like getting out of jail and like, you know, going back to work. Cause I had just been through this fucking ordeal for two months. I was away for two months. That was so life changing and so dramatic that coming back to reality was just like, it didn't feel right. It felt like I shouldn't be there. You know what I mean? Um, and I remember my buddy, uh, Jerry, had like welcomed me back in such a nice way because he knew what I went through was really rough. And my brother as well, they were so happy for me and so proud of me. But deep down inside, man, I was so fucked up. Like, I was so depressed. I was so, you know, just like fucked up from all the trauma that I had just been through. And I didn't know how to fucking deal. I didn't know how to fucking deal. But luckily, I had one thing that was the saving grace. And that was wow. Again, I came back. This is probably like 2013, 2012, maybe now. So I don't know what's out. Maybe like MOP or something. And, um, you know, I had wow. And that was my only fucking escape, man. Um... You know, and like, I remember there was a time where I don't think I came out of the house for like a month because I was so, like, I was having horrible fucking nightmares. This is like, I was having really bad, um, waking nightmares all around this time. So I, you know, I told you guys about this before. I would have these dreams where I would wake up and I couldn't move my body. Like, it was like I was strapped down in the, um, in the bed again in the psych ward. And I couldn't move my body, but my eyes were open and I could see the room around me. I could see everything around me, but then these shadowy figures would come out of sometimes the windows or come out of the walls or come out of the door. One of the door was behind me in this bedroom. So they, I had this one window with a broken fucking, um, uh, sh um, curtain or, you know, the things, whatever they're fucking called. And these shadows would come out of the window and would form right in front of my bed and sometimes would just stand there and like look at me and sometimes one of the shadows would come climb up onto me literally climb up onto my chest and 
it would like morph into this like i remember the one time when i thought i got that girl pregnant and morphed into like this shadow baby and it feels like someone's standing on your chest right it's the weirdest scariest fucking thing and all i'm trying to do is to move one finger to move a little bit and i'm trying to scream i'm going ah! And this is, you know, Phil would always say that he would always sometimes hear me screaming in the middle of the night. It's usually because I was having uh, a waking nightmare. And, you know, that went on for fucking months. Probably, no, years after I got out of... Uh, it was bad before, though. Um, like I said, it was, I had them... I, I had these since I was a kid. But after I got out of um, the psych ward and rehab is when it was at its worst. I would have them pretty much every night. I would often sleep with the lights on because sleeping with the lights on would make these shadow people not appear. It would only happen when it was like complete darkness. Um, so I'd often sleep with the lights on. And, you know, sometimes they, uh, they would um, like speak to me. And yeah, it was like weird, man. It was really fucking scary. Um, yeah yeah man I, I yeah girls and like you know i've had i've had some other like crazy you know experiences like that but these waking nightmares were so terrifying because you're not able to move and you're not able to do anything and it, it's it it's it was similar to that complete loss of uh control that complete just helplessness that I had when I was strapped down, uh, to the bed in the psych ward. Right. So like, it was almost like, uh, like it happened so much more, I think because of that, because of like, you know, I had this horrible fucking thing happen, but you know, luckily I had amazing support around me. You know, I had my brother, I had Jerry, I had my mom and, you know, at this point I, um, was, doing okay like I, I had done i think okay for about another almost a year at this point but what i was doing man and what i realized now which is, i think really important to talk about is the fact that i wasn't facing any of the shit that caused me to want to use in the first place i wasn't looking at all the fucking issues i had when i was a kid i wasn't looking at how I felt with my self-esteem because of my weight and my Tourette's and my tics and all these other issues that I had. I wasn't looking at, you know, um, my anxiety and my isolation and all this other shit. I wasn't looking at any of that and any of the problems that I had. I was just trying to put a band-aid on the issue and not face the facts and just trying to move on with my life without actually doing work. And that never worked. That never worked. No matter what you could do, no matter if you're, you know, that you go on methadone, which I had been on, which did help me, like, you can do anything if you're not actually, and this is why, you know, I think a lot of people recommend the 12 steps, because if you actually do the 12 steps, it helps you deal with these things. But you don't have to do the 12 steps to, to, to recover. You can do that work with a therapist. You can do that as long as you actually do that work. And look into, you know, and, and trying to learn to cope with these things without drugs, right? So, I wasn't at that point yet. My only coping mechanism at this point was isolating, escaping into a family world, fantasy world like WoW, and um, food, right? And so those three things were my coping mechanisms when I wasn't using, which are not great, they're not good things, but they're a lot better than fucking shooting heroin, right? So, that lasted for about another year. Then I got to this most recent relapse, nine years ago, uh, which was the worst. So, at this point in my life, I had done some really, really, really bad things. I had moved back in with my mom, had gotten a fight with my stepdad, got arrested, um, all this crazy shit happened, got kicked out, um, moved into this place, um, 
I ended up having, I, you know, I had, a, I, I was a musician my whole life, right? Had all this music equipment. Morphe, thank you again for the gifted sub. I love you. You're the best. I had all this music equipment. I had all this stuff that I had accumulated over the years. I ended up selling all of it. My drum set, my, my fucking Fender Stratocaster, my basses, my everything I had. I mean, like 10,000, I had a, I had a recording um, set up. I had a, you know, amazing, um, uh, piano, all this shit sold it all. And I sold it for so cheap. Ended up selling all my furniture, ended up selling, you know, over that year I'd accumulated some money. I had, I had got, got some money for myself. I got things that I always wanted. Um, and everything that I gained, I lost within a month. Then I met this girl. Okay. This girl initially met her at a meeting. This girl was, I don't want to speak ill on anyone, but like she was probably one of the worst things that ever happened to me. Okay. My brother to this day hates her and my mom hates, like they hate everything about this person. She was a very sick person. Okay. She was addicted to crack and heroin as well. Um, and you know, she would do things that were very bad. Um, you know, I remember she would like, there were times where we tried to get clean and she wanted to go down to, you know, you know, she would hitchhike and go down to use. And I would say like, no, don't go. I would try to like stop her from leaving that the, she would call the cops and tell the cops that I was abusing her. And they, you know, thank God didn't believe her, but shit like that, you know, she would tell me she was pregnant. Just crazy shit. So this was spiraled into just the most unhealthy relationship you can ever imagine. Um, you know, we're doing heroin together. This is the point where I'm really, really bad. Like I'm doing a lot of drugs, a lot of heroin, just basically just heroin and crack at this point. Um, you know, there were points where I was, you know, like living, like I, I remember one point I was like basically living out of my car, was spending time down in, uh, you know, the get like the, the worst part of Philly all the time. Uh, I had gotten robbed by gunpoint, had gotten robbed by knife, had gotten beaten up, had fucking, I mean, this, this was like, I'm trying to consolidate this because it's such a large, so much stuff happened. I don't want to go into a whole nother story like I did with the, the hospital. And I also don't want to like, seem like I'm like, you know, I, I, I just want to like, you know, basically... I was like homeless for a little bit. I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing. I would hope and pray every day that next time I shot up, this would be the one that took me out. This would be the one that took me out. The only thing that kept me from doing that was how bad I felt that if my mom or my brother were to walk in on me and find my dead body, that was the only fucking thing that ever held me from like really, you know, um, and, but you know, it was really, I, I was lucky because that never did happen, but I was also really lucky because my mom and my brother decided that they were going to get help. And that, you know, my mom had kicked me out. And even though I had gotten really bad after that, it was probably the best fucking thing she had ever done for me because no longer did I have someone just, you know, bailing me out whenever I got in trouble, paying my bills and all this. So I had to face all these consequences on my own. And the girl I was with was doing you know, a lot of, like I said, unsavory stuff doing, you know, she had gotten into a lot of trouble. She had a court case coming up because she, her dad worked for the Philadelphia PD and she had stolen a gun and that gun was used in a murder. Um, so she got in a lot of trouble for that. Okay, mother, I'm telling you. Um, and then I, I, like I said, I was an IV drug user at that time, right? So I was, you know, injecting heroin every day, a lot of it, um, and smoking crack. Um, so, you know, it's a very unhealthy thing, obviously, right? But I had a... Um, what's called a fuck and what well, is basically an infection. I have pictures of it, but I cannot show it on YouTube because it's disgusting uh, or on, on Twitch because it's disgusting. So 
my leg is like this big, right? An abscess, yes. But it was on the, it was in the inside of my leg, though. And here's the thing. I wasn't shooting up on my leg. But somehow this infection had traveled down into my leg. Um, and I wasn't going to the hospital. And, you know, because every, every time it would hurt, I would just get high. I would shoot up again. My leg eventually got about three times the size of normal. It hurt so bad that just touching it, okay, even just touching it, it felt like it was going to explode. Excruciating pain. Finally, thank God for my ex's mom, because she's like, Matt, I'm fucking taking you to the hospital. You're about to die from fucking septic shock. Because I was like, I had a fever. Like... The doctor basically said, so they took me into surgery immediately. They drained it. I was on IV antibiotics for three fucking weeks. The doctor told me that if I waited another day, I would be in second shopping and I would have been dead. 100%. 100 fucking percent. He's like, it's a miracle that you're alive right now. Um, so I'm in the hospital and I'm fucking sick as fuck, right? I'd actually gotten my ex to come in and smuggle me, um, uh, not heroin, but just Suboxone so that I wouldn't be dope sick. Um, and that only lasted a couple days, right? And she was, she was living in the apartment that I owned at that time because I had fucking finagled money out of a bank somehow. Um, and, you know, basically doing things with other guys in there for money so she could get high. Uh, you know what? I mean, like, yeah, addiction is a sickness, guys. I'm not trying to judge it, but that, that's what was going on. I didn't know any of this was going on. Um, so, finally, I get out of the hospital, and I start using it again. But something in my mind changed, right? I saw what was going on in my life, okay? My apartment that I was living in, what well, wasn't really, it was just like, it was just basically... I mean, there were little black handprints all over the wall from when uh, my ex would smoke crack. And, you know, from the chore on her hands, she would smoke and then she would go into these completely psychotic, like paranoid things and and start going at, on the wall. So they had all these like chore black marks all over the walls. There's holes in the walls. There's all this shit, you know, all over the place and just needles everywhere and empty you know bags everywhere and just um you know it was completely you know, no food um you know and then like it was just hell it was absolute hell there's another word for it and then one day some guy had picked her up to do whatever so she can go get high and I, I still remember, I, I'm, I'm, I, to this day, I was looking out the window. And, you know, people in, in, in recovery would say, they call this like a moment of clarity. Or a, a moment of um, just absolute clarity. Right? And something in my head was like, I do not want to fucking live like this anymore. I did not want to die. Something just clicked in my head. Right? And I was like, I called my mom. And my mom, at this point, like I said, she had, you know, kicked me out. And like, but she always made it clear. She's like, Matt, when you're ready for help, fucking call me. And we'll get you help. So I call my mom. And it's almost like someone was testing me, right? Um, because she's like, Matt, listen, I'm here to help you. I do whatever we can, but I just called. There's no fucking rehabs around us that are open right now. They're taking anyone. Only place I can get you is in this town called Galax, Virginia, which is about a 16 hour bus ride. So like, it's like basically giving me every excuse to just say like, no, fuck that. I want to keep using. And I was just like, I completely give up my fucking fate. Like, I was just like, that's it. I, I, I will do whatever the fuck I have to. I told her, I was like, I don't care what it is. I don't care if I have to go to fucking Alaska. I, I, 
I will do it. And she was like so relieved. Right. And, um, and yeah, so I went to rehab and it's not the end of the story, right? Because other shit happened there. I mean, I met this girl in rehab, um, ended up living with her and then we moved to North Carolina together. Um, you know, she ended up drinking and doing stuff and I ended up staying clean. And, and then I came here to Philly, back to Philly with my mom. And I stayed clean for those three years when I was with her. But the thing was, again, I never really worked on myself. Never really worked on the shit that made me want to use in the first place. So when I came to Philly and I got involved in this program that I was in and I found a counselor who actually fucking worked with me, I completely said, I'll do whatever the fucking takes. I I have all this shit wrong with me. I have this, this, that, that, and that. I want to work on and I want to get through all this and little bit by little bit, man, like I started changing as a person. I started, you know, looking at all the things that, you know, I had, I had, um, wrong with me for when I was younger. I started looking at the trauma that I had gone through. I had started looking at, you know, the issues that I had my mental health, uh, with my tics, with my Tourette's, with my, you know, um, anxiety. I had started talking about all my like insecurities. I had stopped st- talking about, you know, all these uh, issues that I had and all this shit. And it was just like, and I brought my mom into sessions. I brought my brother into sessions. We talked about everything, man. And it was like, holy fuck. I understand why I use now. And it was like, you know, and I no longer, and, and little bit by little bit, I started to feel like this is the person that I, I'm meant to be. Like, I thought the person who I was on drugs was, you know, was the best version of me. But then I realized that wasn't me at all. That was this that was this person who I thought I should be because of what I thought people wanted me to be. I was this person who was not compassionate, who didn't care about other people, and was a fucking jackass when I was on drugs. And yeah, maybe I got girls and maybe I was popular, but I wasn't fucking happy. And now I can honestly say that like that's not who I am. You know, I I am a compassionate person. I care about other people. I like, you know, helping other people and like actually got to find myself and like actually accept who I was as a person, you know, and only way I was able to do that was, you know, I had had initially gone on methadone, which, you know, a lot of people talk shit on methadone, man. That shit saved my life, dude. You know, I'll be open about it with you guys because a lot of people talk shit and say, you know, but listen, man, everyone's addiction is different. Everyone's recovery is going to be different, bro. So I had gone on it, but here's the thing. This place was strict with it. If you ever had a bad urine, they take everything away from you. You can't, you can't go there and be on a, uh, and have dirty urines. Right? So when I had seen other people who were on methadone and I'd be like, man, that, that shit's fucking them up. Like, that. no, it wasn't that they were taking other drugs with it, or they were taking way too much than they were supposed to. So like my place did it right. They only allowed you to do, you know, take the methadone and you had to have a plan. You had to go to, um, you know, you had to go to, uh, your groups. You had to go to, and here's the thing, man. It's like when methadone or, you know, suboxone, when it's done right, when you actually, are doing it the way it's intended, it allows your brain to slowly come back without dealing with that impact of being off of everything. I mean, guys, I was on heroin for the, like, and opiates for the majority of my life. It's gonna, it, it's gonna take a long time for me to, you know, uh, for my brain to get back to normal. And being on the methadone allowed my brain to start slowly going back to normal and start slowly getting back so slowly getting back, start slowly getting back while I was working on all this other shit with my life. So anyone out there who, and man, it was so fucked up, right? Because like people would go to meetings and there would be people who were struggling and they come in there on, on methadone or on Suboxone or whatever. And they weren't like high, they weren't fucked up, but they would say something and they would talk about it. And the people at the meetings would be like, you got to leave. You can't leave because you're not really clean. Like that is so fucked up. But you know, 
I, I'm, I'm not gonna I don't want to judge people because you know everyone has their own recovery everyone has their own road man my road was my road someone else's road is someone else's road um, but some people you know really look down on people that have been on some kind of um, medicated treatment that's what helped me man that's what got me clean and for someone else it could be a completely different story you know someone else they might go and you know go cold turkey off drugs they might go and um you know do um i know i know i know guys who you know they smoke pot every day and that's what they do and it's like you know what dude if you're doing that every day and you're not doing heroin and they've been doing that for 10 years who the fuck am i to judge who am i to judge man you know and especially when I started working as a like as a um, uh, um, CRS certified recovery specialist, I saw people of all different walks of life, you know, doing all different kinds of recovery. Some people on methanol, and guess what? The worse and worse the heroin epidemic got, the more people were going on methadone and actually recovering. Here's the thing, now, dude. What is out there is so fucking dangerous. And is so powerful that the majority of people who try to do it without, I'm not saying you can't do it without medication treatment, just treatment, but the amount of uh, people who don't, their success rate is lower than the people who do. Okay. And I really feel like, you know, everyone has to do their own thing, man. Everyone has to, you know, there's such a thing called, um, fuck, I can't remember the name. Um, Basically, it's like if someone's doing heroin every day, right? And their norm now is doing weed every day. It's like, okay, you know, and if you want to get off the weed eventually, that's great. We'll work towards it, but let's do one thing at a time. You know, people are dying every fucking day. Don't rush to try to say, oh, I want to get off everything and do this. You know, I want to, I want to try and, you know, I mean, the reality was every time I did that, I relapsed. Yes, I wasn't working the program properly, 100%, right? But it was I was so depressed because of what was going on, you know? And for me, the way that I worked for me was by, you know, going on methadone, by going on a on a on a, on a program, by doing that, and I am where I am today because of that. You know, you have successful stories no matter what, as long as you in your head want to be clean, if you truly want to, doesn't matter if you're on fucking methadone, if you're not on methadone, you're doing seven, the, uh, you know, if you're doing the 12 steps, if you're on Suboxone, whatever it is, if you in your head have the mentality to say that I want to get clean and I'm willing to do whatever it takes, that is all you need to get clean. You don't need a special program. You don't need this. You need to fully accept the fact that this is what you want in your life and be willing to do what it takes, you know? Um, thank you guys. Kenny, I'm appreciate it. Uh, abusing weed and alcohol for four years every day. I'm sober now for two months. Good for you, man. Yeah. For so, and here's the thing. I know a lot of people out there and people say, oh man, this guy's addicted to weed. You know, I mean, alcohol obviously isn't it, but I know people who were just addicted to weed and addiction guys, addiction doesn't matter what the fuck it is, right? What matters is the effect of it. So People who smoke weed every day and other people would say, oh, you're not really an addict. You're just addicted to weed. Are you fucking, that doesn't matter. All that matters is how is this affecting your life? Are you not able to live every day normally because of, of this? Are you running out of money? Are you not able to hold a job? Are you, are you losing, you know, your, your kids? Are you doing this? The, the effects of the addiction is what matters. Not so much. I mean, obviously if you're on heroin or other things like this, you know, you're going to have withdrawal, you're going to have pain, you know, that's, you know, another thing, but this is why gambling addiction, right? Food addiction, sex addiction. It's not about so much of the substance. It's about the damage that the substance does to the person because of their addiction. Okay. So I always hated when someone would laugh at someone because of, Oh, they're only addicted to this or to that. It's like, dude, fuck you. You have no understanding of what this person's going through. You have no understanding of how it's affecting them. So good for you. And I'm not obviously, you know, and, and, and alcohol, I was never fully addicted to alcohol, but I think alcohol is, 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 is 100% probably 
you know, one of the hardest things to recover from because, I mean, look, guys, I, you know, I mean, you think about it, it's like, fuck, I want to travel, I want to go places, it's like, oh, but I can't have another drink for the rest of my life, you can't think about it like that, you have to think about one day at a time, man, one day at a time, for today, I'm not going to drink, for today, I'm not going to drink, that's all that fucking matters, that's all that matters, once you get that in your mind, that today is the only thing that matters, I don't care what happens tomorrow or 30 years from now, you can still enjoy life, because, you're not going to enjoy life because of alcohol, no, it's all about the mentality, man. When I realized that the success to recovery was just telling myself to just stay clean for today and waking up and doing that every day, it made it so much simpler for me, man. So much simpler. And, you know, you can't let yourself live in the future all the time, right? Because, you know, I would think about, oh, man, I'm going to be 20 when I was younger. I'm going to be 21 and I can't drink because, you know, like I said, the first moment of the rehab, it was like uh, 19. And that was the kind of thinking that really hurt myself because I wasn't allowing myself to live in the moment and live in the day. But yeah, man, alcohol, like alcohol is so fucking destructive, dude. So destructive. And like I said, you know, alcohol withdrawal and um, Benzo, Xanax and stuff like that. Those withdrawals are the two worst withdrawals. Talking about how, I guess before I was going to say some of my worth withdrawal. I remember when I was withdrawing off of Xanax one of the times, um, really bad. I was withdrawing off of Xanax, and um, again, a, another doctor who I was paying out of pocket, by the way, I was paying him $180 a month to keep prescribing me Xanax and um, amphetamines. And I went cold turkey off of both the Xanax and the amphetamines. I didn't sleep for two days, for two weeks, I'm sorry, I didn't sleep for two weeks straight, 14 days, I did not sleep, I could not lift my body off of a couch for almost two weeks, it was the worst experience, the shit that I was going through in my head, every day, struggling to just even have the will to survive, Xanax withdrawal and alcohol withdrawal are not only deadly, because I was having these mini seizures all the time, you know, many jolts and seizures, and it was, and I remember I would hear my heart out of my chest like this, because I was also withdrawing off amphetamines, my heart would go like, do 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 boom, boom, and then stop, and then do 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 it was fucking terrifying, man, terrifying, and like I say, it's a miracle that I'm alive today, a fucking miracle, and, and I think it's important to every once in a while talk about this stuff and look back, because... When you have bad days, or if you're going through something, you know, um, it, it's it's really important to, you know, go back and, and be grateful. Be grateful for, um, you know, what I have. And I think, like, a lot of times it's, it's, it's easy to forget about, you know, uh, where, where we came from. So I think, you know, sometimes it's just good to, to look back. Um, oh yeah, Metal, let me give you, hold on, let me, uh, one sec, I'll give you, let me just go through some of these, um, uh, comments. Um, started we when I was early teen, then almost every day, nearly a decade, last couple of years, been able to quit a month. Dude. And it's, it's tough, man. Like I said, I smoked weed every fucking day when I was 12 years, 12, 13, 14, and, um, it got really bad for me. And I, you know, like eventually when I graduated to heroin and, uh, on opiates, I had stopped, um, uh, because I didn't want that to interfere with my feeling of like, you know, but dude, I mean, dude, I know a lot of fucking people who are addicted to pot a lot, man, a lot. And I mean, man, some people, some people, when they're addicted to pot, they get really fucking depressed because they get into this habit of just doing nothing of feeling like kind of like lazy um but it really is like a it can be right a complete motivation drainer where it just takes every ounce of your motivation away from you and for me too when i smoke pot it would actually make my ticks worse i would also i would, I would a lot of times get really 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 bad ticks and um and my paranoia would get a lot worse too but you know that's besides the point, but like, yeah, I, I think anything can become addictive. Anything can really, I mean, you know, 
but in different ways, right? And 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 different addictions are going to have different outcomes, right? Um, but man, someone like myself who has an addictive nature, I really have to be careful with things. Like obviously, I'm addicted to nicotine. You know, I smoke my vape. Um, you know, I have issues with food still, right? I still use food sometimes as a something to feel good, even though I'm really trying to work on that. Um, video games, you know, um, WoW had been, you know, a way for me to cope for a long time. I'm not playing it right now. So like, I, you know, it's, I'm always trying to balance my life in some way. I still go, I still go to this. I'm going to be clean nine years. I still go to see my counselor every month, every month I talk to her, I go there and see her. And that is so important, man. Like mental health to me and also giving it away, right? Like Talking like this, you know, my mom and I are going to start another group up, um, a family night soon and helping other people, you know, it, we do it selfishly, right? Because yeah, maybe I'm helping someone else and that's great. It's amazing if I can do that, but it's, it's helping me, you know what I mean? Like talking about this right now is reminding me why the fuck I got clean, you know what I mean? And the implications of if I were to relapse and just because I've been clean nine years doesn't mean I'm invincible, right? Or soon to be nine years. You know, I still have to be vigilant. I still have to work on it. Um, still smoke a lot of cigarettes and order too much food, though. Hey, man, work on one thing at a time, brother. You know, and that's, you know, we're all going through shit. And I always tell people, you know, work on one thing at a time, man. Do not get too hard on yourself because guess what? That's when you, it starts to get really hard when you get, you know, and you have that guilt. Do not allow the guilt to control you because guilt is a really fucking powerful thing, my man. You know, you work on one thing at a time and you'd be proud of yourself for that. Be proud of yourself every day when you see, and you know what? We all have days where we don't do so well, but the most important thing is to not let that guilt control you. And when that next day comes completely start and say, this is a new slate. I'm not going to let what happened yesterday affect me. And I'm going to start over today. And guess what? That is the most important thing is like when you have a relapse of any kind, whether it's you know, you ate too much or you smoked a cigarette or you smoked a joint or whatever. The most important thing is to not let the guilt of that relapse control you to turn around and say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to do what I was, what I, what I need to do. I'm going to work on that for today. I'm going to make sure that I don't relapse today. And you know, the next day will come and work on one day at a time. That is the most powerful thing you can do after a relapse is to learn from your mistake, look back and say, Hmm, how did I get to this point? How did I allow myself to get into this negative thinking or this, this, um, you know, what happened? Look at that, learn from that. And the next day you turn around and be strong. You know, not, I don't like saying being strong because you're not weak. doesn't mean you're weak because you're relapse, but turn around and, you know, work on that day and make that day, make the best of it. Um, Step by step, exactly, man. Yeah. Uh, what technique you have? So interesting. That's an interesting question. So I, I have a lot of different ticks, and this is something that I don't really talk about often because um, I don't know why. But I do a lot of facial ticks. You can see um, like that. And sometimes when I think about them, it makes it worse. But that's okay. So sniffing like that i have a head tick which this one is fucking sucks right because sometimes i like bang my head like that and it fucking hurts man and uh i get scared sometimes when i give myself some kind of fucking like brain damage right but i also have a lot of like body ticks where i move certain parts of my body in certain ways it's almost like you have an itch that you have to fucking scratch right so it's like the more that i try to ignore the tick the worse it makes it and then I have to fucking, you know, I have to do it. So I have a ton of different ticks. Um, they're sometimes they're worse. Sometimes they're not as bad, but I've always throughout my entire life have always had some kind of tick. I've never, there's never been a time in my life where I say, ah, oh, I didn't have a tick. They're not, no, I've always had, even if it's a minor tick, right? Even if it's something with my foot or with my hand or something like that, I've always had some kind of minor tick. Um, and you know, it, 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 it's something that I have accepted as a part of me, but it does affect me. You know, it does have uh, an effect. I'm no longer, um, self-conscious about it like I used to be, but it does bother me 
when I'm trying to relax or I'm trying to sit down and go to sleep. I have a lot of trouble sleeping, man, because I don't know if it's because of the PTSD from when I was in the psych ward of being strapped down in a bed. I and mean, this is something that my mom talked to me about. I didn't even think about it. But I think sometimes when I lay in bed, I because I can fall asleep on the couch sometimes. But when I lay in bed, my tics start to get really bad. And I have a lot of trouble sleeping because I'll be tired as fuck. I'll shut off all the lights. I'll lay in bed. And as soon as I lay in bed, it's like my fucking brain goes like, and I got, oh, I got to do this tick. I got to do this. I got to do that. Gotta do that. And I have all these tics and they start getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And my tics do get worse with anxiety. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that, that, that is, a, that is a reason, but you know, I try, I, I do things, I do like, you know, calming like things in my head where I try to like think of something that's calming or, or read something or do something. But yeah, I have a lot of trouble sleeping, um, because of that. And I, a lot of times I'll end up falling asleep on the couch. Nine years. Well done. Thank you, man. Yeah, it'll be nine years in January, nine years on January 24th, my mom's birthday. Um, to other humans. Yep. The worst time for me is when it feels like there's nothing a hundred percent. Yes. And you know, I was thinking today, I was thinking today about like what I want to talk about and you know, I, I, I like having fun. I, obviously, you know, you're not going to do the whole stream talking about this, but I'm um, I really like having like light, lighthearted discussions and talking about stuff, but I think sometimes it's important to uh, to just acknowledge, you know, mental health and and to, to talk about it because I always want people to feel as though you know it's okay to talk about something if you're having an issue, if you want to talk, if you want to just get things out there. And I think you know for me, it's a good outlet for me to air shit out as well. Um, and it's also, I think, you know, it could help people. It could, it could, it could, um, impact someone in a way. So it's, it's a, it's a win-win, you know, it, it helps me. It helps other people. Um, Mr. Beautiful Dev Kent, welcome back. Thank you so much, Duck Man. Um, I told my parents, uh, well, yeah, it's very similar to us, Frizzo, sorry, your, your story. Uh, I think I was four, five when my parents got divorced. Um, yeah, man. A lot of people, here's something that's really fucking, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible, but it's a fact. Um, I would say 90% of addicts have some kind of trauma in their past, you know, different kinds of trauma. Um, trauma could be anything from, you know, a divorce to, um, you know, your friends treating you a certain way. I mean, like, obviously there's different kinds of trauma, but so, so many addicts, like for me, it was a mix of things, right? You know, I had the gene. Um, my dad was an addict. My mom's brothers were addicts. It's on both sides of the family. I had the, um, the, the, it was in my environment. Right. And then I had the mental health issues, you know? So it's a lot of different things that can, um, that can lead to it. And I think it's very important if you are someone who is, you know, uh, predisposed to addiction to, you know, get mental health, you know, to, you know, talk about it to, you know, if you have kids, you know, at a young age, you want to try to educate them and shit like that. Because man, the level of education when I was growing up, that's why like my mom always kind of like, she, 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 she kind of like, um, has like, a, I think some guilt cause she's like, Oh, I wish I knew what I knew now, uh, then, you know, cause I would have helped you more. I'm like, mom, Mom, you can't think like that. Right. Because first of all, the amount of information back then was so less than what we have now. Second of all, you did the best you could with what you had. You know what I mean? Like my mom was a single mom for a long time, working two, three fucking jobs to support me and my brother. You know what I mean? So like, it's, 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 it's important to not let that fucking guilt, uh, get you. Um, thank you, man. I appreciate you guys. And Morphe, thank you again for another gifted sub. You're amazing, Morphe. I really appreciate you. Yeah, a good reason. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Another important thing. For so, and I'm really, I'm really, I'm really, um, 
grateful for you to opening up about that stuff and, and, and talking with me. And here's something that I want to say that I didn't realize had a huge impact on me. Okay. So like seeing a counselor or seeing a therapist is so fucking different when you actually connect with the therapist on a real fucking level. Okay. I had seen so many counselors and therapists in my life a lot from a fucking young age to all the way to now. Okay. Number one, I was lying to myself a lot at the time. So I was lying to the counselor, right? I wasn't telling him the truth. So it's not so much the counselor's fault as it was mine, especially early on. Um, number two, I also had a lot of counselors who I didn't connect with. Okay. And I think it's, it, especially as someone now who I had been in their place, right. As a certified recovery specialist, it's really hard to get to that point where you can get with someone to make them feel comfortable to talk about things that they don't even talk to. They don't even admit to themselves. Right. So, I mean, when I met the counselor that I have now, it didn't happen right away, but there was something about my uh, readiness to want to get clean, but also about her willingness to call me out on my bullshit, but not in a way that made me um, want to uh, like like repress and, and, and go backwards, right? So... It was amazing and, and and the nuance of having like a really good it's like this kind of back and forth and somehow my counselor would say something in a way right like okay i would say something like I, you know, just like this okay she's like hey matt how you doing today I'm like oh yeah i'm great i'm doing really good um you know i, I got this i got that and she'd be like okay um you know, and, and, but like something in the tone of how she said it or in a way how she like wouldn't go to the next thing. And like, these just these little nuanced things that would make me realize that like, okay, she totally didn't fucking buy that. You know what I mean? And without even really saying much, she would make me want to go back and say, you know what? I actually, things aren't okay. Um, you know, this fucking happened, this fucking happened. And it got to the point where I was so comfortable to talk with her about anything. And I think that is so fucking important, man. Like I can't underplay that, you know, like it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a really like good thing, an amazing thing when you have that kind of rapport with a counselor, like something about a good counselor is like, they're always on your side, right? No matter what, however, Sometimes being on your side means calling you out on something. You know what I mean? So, and when I say calling you out, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean like, aha, I got you. You know what I mean? It's, it's not like that, right? It's more like, um, okay, right? So it's more like, I understand how you feel, right? Um, is there anything else that, 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 you know, like asking like, oh, do you think maybe there's anything else? going on or like, you know, maybe asking more of a deeper question regarding of what something I said, or just not letting it go and not, not jumping to the next thing. Like I was trying to right? So like calling out in a way that isn't direct, isn't like in your face like that, but it's, but it's subtle, right? It's subtle and it's not allowing. So one thing I, when I was dealing with a client, yeah. McKay, Michaela, that, that's a problem. That's a, that's a problem. Like if you don't trust your therapist, you, you, I mean, you don't have to tell them, right. You don't have to say, I don't trust you, but you have to, you have to address that in some way, um, by either, you know, saying, Hey, listen, this isn't working out with us. I need to find someone else. And listen, as a counselor, you know, I, I had people tell me that, like I, when I was working with people as a CRS, Someone would say, Hey, listen, I don't know if I really connect with you because you know, maybe, maybe the person wanted, if it was a woman, maybe they wanted a female, right? That's completely okay. You know, you have to have tr trust is the most important thing with a counselor. The most important, if you're going to be telling someone things about yourself that you've never told anyone else, you have to have to have to trust them. Right? So 
building that trust is so important and it takes a while. Now, here's the thing. Some people, I'm not saying you or anyone, but I'm saying like um, me, I was like that. I never allowed myself to connect to a therapist, right? Because I always wanted to hide and I always wanted to say that things were okay when they weren't. Also, sometimes, you know, I, I would have a client that would point out everything that was wrong and then blame everyone else but themselves, right? And this happens a lot, um, you know, especially in addiction. Um, and it's, you know, it's basically, you know, just trying to put blame in other places that allows that person to feel like they're the victim, which they are in a lot of cases, but, you know, in, 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 in their life and, and in that way really have no control over their life whatsoever, right? If they're, if they're the victim of everything, right? So there's also subtle ways to, um, tell people, you know, in, in, in a way that to, to try to be, uh, more responsible for their own, for their own, um, actions. Right. But, you know, all that aside, that was something else completely separate from what I was saying about, you know, the trust issue. So the trust thing, number one is if you go to someone who feels like, first of all, they're not listening to you, that is very important, right? So if you talk to someone and you feel like maybe this person really isn't listening to me, um, they're not really understanding what I'm saying, right? Number two, the trust thing. Okay. So when people say like, how can you not trust the therapist? Right? So it's not like you, you don't trust them to, you know, not talk about you, right. Or to talk about their colleagues. It's not that kind of like trust. It's more of like a trust is like, I don't trust that this person has my back. Right. Or has, it's almost like a, a more of a connection. Okay. So I've had counselors and, and maybe it is a different thing with you, which is, you know, it could, it could be, for, but for me, right. I've had counselors when, when I felt like I didn't trust them, it was more like, I feel like they don't really have my intentions, um, as their most important thing. So like my counselor right now, I know that if I were to bring my mom in to a counseling session, my counselor is on my side. 100 fucking percent, 100 percent, right? So that is like the kind of trust I'm talking about, okay? So, and I'm not saying the counselor isn't going to, um, you know, say, okay, you know, Matt, what you did, maybe, you know, but the counselor, like, so I'll, I'll give an example, right? My mom comes into a counseling session and she goes, Matt's not doing this. Like, say I'm living with my mom, right? He's not doing his chores. He's not doing this. He's not doing that. He's not doing this. We agreed that he was going to do this. We agreed that he was going to do that. And then the counselor turn around and saying, okay, you know, um, ma'am, I understand your anger. I understand why you're upset, but you know, how about we talk to Matt and get his side and try to understand what's going on with him. That is a counselor having your back and having that trust. Okay. So and this happens a lot, man. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you have a counselor and like, especially with, with someone else, like they will not so much take a side, but like they have to be very careful when someone's in that position to not make them feel like they're being jumped on. You know what I mean? Like that is the worst fucking feeling in the world. Like everyone's just jumping on you and, and coming at you because when you're someone's counselor, you are part of that you're in their corner 100 percent 100 percent and that is what the trust is about right that is what it's about and so that is what you want to look for in a counselor you want to look for someone that is in your corner 100 percent not so much i'm not talking about giving you excuses right i'm not talking about giving you an excuse as to why i didn't do this as why i didn't do that but is there for you and it wants to understand and help you get to the root at why you're not doing these things in a way that isn't aggressive and isn't in your face and isn't jumping on you. And like I said, it takes time. It takes a lot of fucking time. The best thing a counselor can do is fucking, especially for the first, well, always is, is listen, right? It's fucking listen and, you know, really, really listen and understand where the person's coming from. 
And if you have a counselor who feels or you feel like it's not listening to you and it's not understanding where you're coming from, and there sometimes there's just a barrier between age, between sex, between all these different things. And sometimes it just works out to where you don't have a connection with them, and that's fine. I think people need to realize that, you know, a little bit more that it's okay to ask for another counselor or another therapist. Like if you don't connect with the person that you're seeing, just go see another one. Ask and 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 trust me, that therapist, if they're good, they will not take it personally. You know what I mean? And even if they do, fuck them. It's like, you know what I mean? But they're not going to. No counselor should is going to take it seriously. They're just, hey, this person does connect with me. You know what I mean? Being open and ready for therapy. Yep. Yes, body language is so important too. Very important, yeah. They're there for the work and not for your health, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. I'm getting a new one anyway because of traumatic experience less. Good, good. I'm I'm glad. I'm so I'm sorry about your traumatic experience, Michaela. But um yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot of people end up staying with counselors who they're not uh connecting with and you know, they just go there because hey, it might says I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta do this, and it ends up just being like a um you know, like a fucking social visit. It's, you know what I mean? And uh, unfortunately, there's still stigma with it. You know, people still have a stigma with, with seeing a counselor. I think everyone should fucking see a counselor. I really do. I believe, I don't care. If you are the healthiest person in the world, you should see a counselor. Because it's very good to have someone who isn't connected to you. Um, it doesn't have some kind of bias, whether they're a family member or, you know, you know, maybe there's something you don't want to say to your mom. Maybe it's something you want to say to your loved one. Maybe there's something you want to say. You know what I mean? Everyone should have a fucking counselor or a therapist. I really believe that. Hello, everybody. Future Def Camp here. I just wanted to close this video off by saying if you personally are going through something similar to, you know, what I was talking about or any kind of mental health issue, I just wanted to say, please, please go out and try to find someone to talk to. You know, it's a lot easier than you think. There are so many ways and resources to speak with someone through for mental health issues for addiction issues and i really wanted to you know portray that at the end of this video and say that there is a way out there is whatever you're going through there's a way out i know i went through into a lot of detail with certain things of what i was saying and i also maybe skipped i know i skipped a lot here right um but at the time when i recorded this video I was, you know, going through some stuff of my own and I felt like I needed to get out and talk about what I was going through. And I want anyone who's watching to know that I was not trying to, you know, highlight anything in particular or trying to glorify anything in my past. I just was, you know, going through the details as I remembered them. And the main takeaway I wanted to get from this was that it's easy sometimes to forget where, where you come from and what I went through. And a lot of times it's it's really healthy for me to look back and to remember just how bad things were and how much better they are now and how grateful I am for that. So that's why I wanted to share this with you guys. I also wanted to end with this saying, if you are going through something similar, please reach out to someone. Please reach out to a professional. You can talk to me, you can talk to other people's, but you have to also speak to a professional, guys, if you're going through something similar. And I would ask that you would do that. So please stay safe, stay healthy, and I will see you guys next time. Peace.